<laughs> That's really cool. So I want to switch gears here to uh, somebody who, a contemporary of yours, who passed away, uh, Dr. Anthony Flew. At one point, he had the most published works on the subject of atheism. Once a, fear, a fierce opponent of the belief in God, he said the following. I'm going to read his statement. I now believe there is a God. I now think it, the evidence, does point to a creative intelligence almost entirely because of the DNA investigations. What I think the DNA material has done is that it has shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinary diverse elements to work together. Can you explain why this discovery of DNA was so instrumental in convincing this famous atheist that God exists? Yeah, well, first of all, you do realize that that's my work. That, yes, of course. That discussion in front of me. It's on, it's on a wonderful video by a man named Roy Varghese, a wonderful human. He's a, an, an Asian Indian who lives in Dallas, Texas, high tech. He, he brought flute together and me and several other people. I was primarily in that as, as science discovered God, but it's worth looking up as science discovered God, Roy Varghese. He, he put all the funding for it, et cetera. And, and first of all, Flu, Anthony Flu, again, it's amazing because he's a wonderful human being, very, very honest. He said, I have, he says, I follow the school of Socrates. I go to where the truth leads me, which is pretty brave for a person who has spent his entire life, you know, the first 50 or 60 years of his life saying there's no God. And uh, what, what led him to understand that is that first of all, that the universe is fine. And that the complexity that you, the numbers always show that you can't get this by chance. Okay, so maybe there's an infinite universe, whatever. But the specific, specificity, you know, the exactness of, of, the, of the nature in which the DNA records information, which is so extraordinary. We always say DNA, it's amazing. When you study it, you don't, you realize you don't you even have a clue as to the nature of the exactness in which the or information is presented and how it's read you know it doesn't you know you give me a book in russian it doesn't do me any good i can't read you know i couldn't read it at all but so it's not just the information on the dna but it's how it's read as also how it's read and it's the complexity of story that he realized that it's more it's it is overwhelmingly unlikely that it could have happened by chance, even if there are thousands of, of galaxies or thousands of universes. And that's why the secular voice of science in this world called Scientific American says that the only way that you can explain the exactness of the laws of nature, including DNA, how it is is if there, if there are an infinite number of universes or near infinite number, not of, not of galaxies, of universes. And each universe will have its own set of laws and each universe will, will try to make this. And if you have a near infinite number, one's gonna be a winner. You know, that's it, roll the dice, roll the dice. And that's the, only, that's the answer to that, that Scientific American goes, which if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, Scientific American is the most widely read science journal worldwide probably by a factor of 10, because it's not peer review. Peer review takes money. Not that when I peer review an article, I can get paid for it, but it takes time to send it out, being, you know, other, before you publish it, the, your peers read it and say it's garbage or it's good. But Scientific American is not peer reviewed. The only person who has to decide whether it goes in or not is the editor. And if the editor wants to have a per certain spin on the data, that spin goes in and people and people around the world read it because it comes out in multiple languages. So, so, and even that journalist said that the only way you can explain the explain the, the exactness of the laws of nature and the exactness of where they fall together to allow life to happen is a infinite number of universes for which there are no data whatsoever. Right. Then you read the problem. How do you get him? And you're still stuck with exactly the problem that, that we deal with, that I deal with in the proof of God in five minutes. But why is there existence? And then how do you get and how do you get a creation of the universe anyway? You know, you still need the laws of nature. Right. That's the key. And and so, and that's that book. I bet you I, you're, you're, 
is a book called uh, Universe of Nothing by Krauss, a Jewish man, uh, who ends up with the most and I said, purely stupid conclusion that this shows that there's no God. He bypasses the problem that these laws of nature are required. And he was once asked about the laws of nature. Oh, there's nitpickers they're always trying to find in a reason. In other words, he accepts the fact of, that the laws of nature, the whole answer is the laws of nature. Because once you have the laws of nature, you can do lots of things. Like once you have a ball of clay, you can make all types of sculptures. So once you have these laws of nature that can bring a universe into being from nothing physical, that was one mistake I made. I said it brings the universe in from nothing, but it's a universe from nothing physical. That's the key. And that's an error in his title of his book also, because wow. the, a virtual world and the physics in his book, across his book, is 100%. It's the last 10 pages. And then he has in afterward by Dawkins or someone with this most stupid conclusion that this proves there's no God. In fact, it proves there is a God, that the laws of nature are, are a, and that's what, that's what, that's what impressed Flew. And, and just, you know, Okay, I know you'd like to stop. Right. And when the first thing, wonderful thing happened, I didn't even know that it became public. We, we did this interview in, at NYU, and, uh, Varghese, this wonderful human. I uh, got it all together. I come back. And, uh, this, this time goes by. The videos he put together. Flu makes his announcement. I didn't know that. Next thing you know, I, I go into work. People are patting me on the back. I get into Asian Torah and work me. What'd you do? How'd you do it? It turned out that the that it was such a big news that the that one of the one of the carriers lists the five most important news items of the day. And the world is burning. And what was one of the five most important? Anthony Flew recounted his atheism. This is not a Jewish not a Jewish news. It's one of like it's not like I don't know which one it was, uh, but anyway, it was one of the major. Ah, I thought it's got got to work on time. <laughs> so so it just shows. Well, anyway, if you look at the data, it just said at the beginning about when I started studying the from the Jewish point of view. The next thing I was putting a talus, you know, talus to fill in kosher. If at this point, once you study the science from depth, it took this man. but well, it took Fred Hoyle. Look at Fred Hoyle, the man who said Big Bang, become believer. Flew from a philosophical point of view, what became a became a believer. And the New Oh yeah, and the New York Times on its front page Sunday edition had a whole article about this. They mentioned me by name nine times. And usually I had the feeling that they mean they thought I see this poor man, I tricked him or something. Anyway, so that's dinosaurs and then he flew. Wow. So, you know, actually it leads me to, I don't know if you have more time, a little bit more time, but I wanted to get into, because uh, you mentioned Richard Dawkins. He also, um, I, I have a quote from him where he says um, about DNA, because he basically said that, uh, you know, intelligent design might turn out to be the answer to some issues in genetics or in evolution. He said the following, well, if it would come about in the following way, it could come, it could be that at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved, probably by some kind of Darwinian means, probably to a very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this planet. Now, um, now there is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that. If you look at the details of, of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. He then continues to say that it's more likely to be extraterrestrials who created us rather than God. But the question also remains who created them. And, yeah. and I find that atheists tend to point to, you know, they point to this conundrum of, you know, well, who created, who or what created God? And they seem to be rejecting the same version of God that we reject. As the Torah, you know, obviously tells us that God is transcendent. He created time. He created space and matter. So he's not bound by it. He's completely separate, kadosh, right? So with that said, um, why do you think scientists have such a simplistic view of like the Jewish definition of God? Wait, let me just turn the light on here. It's getting so dark here. You know, you're... I'm, sure. I'm, at sunset here, right? Hang on a sec. No, no problem. Sorry. Well, 
Give me, phrase your question in a shorter way so I can. Yeah, so what I, what I want to understand is that they, I feel like the, the atheists in, in the scientific community, they're kind of always, you know, they bring it back to this question about it, God, it's impossible that God would exist, but they come up with all these other scenarios that are just almost as, you know, crazy to think about. Um, why is it that, why do you think they have such a simplistic view of God? Do you, do you believe maybe it's like the... Why do they have a hard time with it? Why do they have a hard time with the concept of God? Where it can... So uh, well, just let me do one thing on the once you quoted by, by, uh, by an ancient civilization. That's, you know, Francis Crick, one of the, one of the Nobel Prize winners for the, for the shape of DNA, uh, said it might be life was, was seeded here by an ancient civilization. So that, that's with Dawkins, it's not something new. But why do they have trouble with God? Well, it makes certain kinds of obligations, I guess. Let's say that's, it doesn't, let's say, they're not, let's say they're not Jewish, so they're not worried about Kashrut and Shabbos and stuff like that. Uh, they, a scientist might say, well, if there's a God entering into the situation, so how can I be sure that my equations are any good? Because maybe God would change them tomorrow, you know, that they, they won't... Uh, the laws of nature might be changed, so I can't even do scientific work because, I mean, that would, I don't, I don't know. I, I, what, what could be the reason? I mean, I hear people tell me that the reason is that it's, the, uh, they don't want to be bound by this morality and all this stuff, but there are a lot of moral atheists, you know, and not everyone is running around having wild whatever you have, you know. I mean, there, there are more, there are, but, but, and they, but they do accept the fact that there is, is a morality, which is interesting. So why, should, is, if the world is just stomp, you know, then why have, well, who cares about morality? Uh, I guess my answer is teach your tongue to say, I don't know. I have no, I don't, I really don't have a good answer. Right. Okay. I'm, don't want to, I'm not convinced that they don't want to be bound by, by mm -hmm. laws of the Bible, but it might be that they don't, they don't want the seven Noahide commandments.